Hi, welcome. Thank you for joining us with Start Simple to Scale Decentralized Identity. With me today is RJ Reiser, Chief Revenue Officer at Liquid Avatar Technologies, and Ken Ebert, who is CTO at Indicio.tech. Um, we're here to talk today about how you can take open source code um, in Hyperledger Aries. Indy and Ursa, along with the Linux Foundation Public Health Cardia project, and build yourself a commercial solution. And so with me today, RJ and Ken are going to talk about their experience doing just that. We hope that our time today will prove to be instructional and also inspirational as you start down this path and journey towards your commercial solutions. And so where I wanna start with is the beginning. The beginning of it all, RJ. All Just right. under a year ago, we didn't even know each other and now we're like BFFs. So yes. I wanna have our audience understand where you were a year ago and what you were considering doing before you maybe even realize these code bases exist. Um, just to let the people who may be new to this space um, understand where the starting point is. Yeah, so so Liquid Avatar, the, the company that, that I'm in charge of our business development is focused on identity and identity solutions. And it was how do you identify who you are um, in person and also online? And we always had this challenge of how do you truly have a secure format where when you say you are who you are, um, there is that high level of trust. There's a high assurance level. And we were doing it in a way, just like when you would log in and, and go to any exchange, you would take photos of your, your a selfie and photo of your credential. And then that would allow you to get into your account. And it was just saved by a login and a password. But is that really truly the most secure way to secure your identity? And as we started digging into it, and we were just another me too with a lot of different companies out there, we found that there is actually a better way to prove who you are online. And it was when I was introduced to your organization and find out some of the things that you're working on and introduced to all these open source products, uh, open source codes, open source communities that I realized there is a better way to do it. It's a paradigm shift. There's a new way that you can now secure your identity and it's one and done. You don't have to keep doing it over and over and over for each organization that you want to work with. You can do it once and then use that verifiable credential moving forward. So Ken, I'm going to ask you to reminisce. Um, I actually think it was around Christmas time that we first started talking to RJ. In fact, I even think, RJ, it may have been the day after Christmas. I was- If not, I was, if not Christmas day. <laughs> I was on a ski trip. Uh, yes. We family vacation. And it was just grinding on me that I knew that there was this, a, a new solution out there and we needed to figure it out. And you guys picked up the picked up the phone and we're willing to take a call. So yeah, I mean, so when you're celebrating pandemic Christmas, you're like, sure, why not? Why not do a call and, and talk to someone? So Ken, you know, setting the scene, it was right after Christmas snow on the ground and RJ calls and he talks about his vision, but also where he is and not quite sure where to go with it. Where do you take um, someone who is in that position, what conversations do you start having as it relates to the open source code that's available to people? The, the first step is to try to articulate the goals of where you want to go. And, and I think RJ is really good at describing long-term goals and then chopping those up into smaller uh, bite-sized chunks so that he's not trying to eat the elephant all at once. And uh, by looking at the long-term goal of establishing a strong identity that can be reused in multiple places with multiple clients, then looking at, well, what are the tools that are going to get us to where we want to go? And I think that we started evaluating some of the open source projects and looked at um, the different roles that are involved in an ecosystem. Uh, verifiable credentials typically are anchored with an issuer. The issuer is the one who says, um, I'm going to make a statement about you. This is your email address, for instance. That's a very simple credential. Uh, I'm going to verify your email address and issue a credential from the issuer to the holder. The holder is usually the end user or a person. Um, 
persons like to move around. They use mobile phones more frequently now than any other type of device for interacting with uh, the internet and their, their uh, online presence. Um, and then there are verifiers, people who need to know that information about you and need to trust it. And so looking at that, we try to identify what are the pieces that are going to match up in the ecosystem that RJ was envisioning and how can we possibly get there in the shortest amount of time? Uh, the, the issuing agent was a, a fairly easy choice. Uh, Aries Cloud Agent Python matched up very nicely with the, the criteria that RJ was um, trying to find. Uh, we had a pretty good idea of how to work with the verifiers using that same type of cloud agent, but the mystery was a little bit in, in the requirements for um, their mobile use case. Their, their mobile use case, they wanted to make, what were some of the criteria, RJ, that you set out for your mobile users? Yeah, so with, with our mobile users, um, it actually goes back to, I was on a couple panels and I was on uh, a couple panels with, with senators. It was definitely a fish out of water. And, and they kept talking about the policies that are coming out, whether it's in Europe, US and in Canada, it puts the, con the power of the data in the hands of the user. So our mobile device needed to make sure that there wasn't a central authority that had the control. It was that the user was in full control. They decide who gets to see the data, who doesn't. And then what's the best part about it is, if I share data with somebody, if one of our users shares data with somebody, how do you follow that process, the right to be forgotten? And this is the foundation that we can get to that point. Now, this is, this is one of the ones that are on the roadmap a little bit further out, but working with all together, the open source community and DCO, we have it specced out and it's the next one in line. So to summarize, it's the control of the data goes to the user. That was the biggest criteria. So, so in looking at the agents that were out there, one of the, the things that you wanted to do is to make it super easy for the end user. And you wanted to, to look at wallet recovery as well. And so for those two reasons, you uh, looked at a what do we need to do to make a custodial type of approach for initial agent launch? And this gave you a couple of advantages, but there were some missing pieces in the open source code. So Most of it's there. You're 100% right. I don't mean to, to jump in, but that was the other one. This is the control. But isn't part of the control, the layer down is, if I lose my phone, whoever has my phone has the control now, right? Or do I have to start all over and get all new identities? So it's putting the control in the hands where it's not tied to the mobile device. It is an account in the cloud that you can go back to and you can get access to it from any device. Right, and that, that um, and the initial target was to use a mobile phone to control the agent that represents the end user. The end user is in complete control of their data all the time, but if they use a mobile device, then they can control the backend agent that represents them and they can uh, store their credentials there safely. It can be backed up in an encrypted form for them. If they lose their phone, they only have to reestablish um, that they are who they say they are and yeah. get a new phone that can control their agent again. So looking at that, there were a couple of pieces missing out of the open source solution. So we identified the minimum viable product that would make that happen. But that, that was kind of the building blocks of getting started to take what was already available in the open source community, bring that into uh, the, the vision that um, Liquid Avatar and RJ had to uh, provide that in a very friendly and usable form to the mobile um, end user. Well, and I think for those who are new or just entering the decentralized identity or SSI space is that if you were to t-shirt size the visions of what they want, it's a triple XL. But also the complexity of this space matches the size and it may even be a four or five X. Um, and so it's really hard when you're faced with a really grand vision and a really absolutely disruptive changing technology. And then you map it against a very confusing space to begin with. And then you add on another layer and you say, okay, an open source code. You, you need, you know, they start hearing names like Aries and Ursa and Indy, and they're like, I'm still trying to figure out how I accomplished my vision. 
um can where i guess maybe rj that was like at the point where you had to start making decisions on how you tackle your vision and then ken what are the stepping stones that you would encourage those who are joined us today to who may be in a similar position to start working through so rj yeah um you know earlier in my career I didn't understand open source code or why you'd want to do it. it. It is baffling to me. But when you start to attack the problem set that we have right now with digital identity and, and security around it, I realized the value and the importance of the open source code. It is so uh, large of a task and such a large challenge that it's not one company that's going to do it. Um, you need to make sure, A, that you give back to the community so the community continues to grow, um, but that it creates the standard that everyone can build to. And when everyone builds this standard, then you have something that can scale. So if I have a digital identity in one location, using in one closed loop ecosystem, because that's where they're starting, right? Um, but how do I use it when I extend outside of that ecosystem? So we need these open standards that everyone can build to and everyone agrees to, comes to a consensus, right? Um, and I, I found that that was the only way we were going to do it. We couldn't do it alone. We, uh, we had to rely on all these different organizations um, and these open standards to, to move it forward and, and realize our vision. So, so one of the advantages of the open source code bases is that you have a community of developers. If you look at the Hyperledger uh, Indie Aries and Ursa code bases, there are over 450 contributors to that set of code. That's an, that's more than the staff that uh, your typical organization has to devote to something like this. But given those contributions from all of those people working together, you can create something that's quite incredible. The open source is the foundation of what you do. And then there's some customization that needs to occur on top of it so that it matches your specific use case and gets tailored to the to the way that you want to use it. So a foundation of open source with some customization on top of it equals a product that is got part of it maintained by an open source community to guarantee that interoperability. And part of it is, is your unique offering that is has got the, the fingerprint or the, the image of um, liquid avatar stamped into it. It's our dif differentiator, right? It, it, it's why are they going to use uh, our solution versus another one? And it's built on that open source, so you can plug and play, and it's interoperable. And, and I know we're going to talk about our interopathon that we just had the other day, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but it's also being able to provide added features of a, a, a user experience that we believe that our users want um, to help grow that community because the one piece uh, there was just an announcement out of Ontario that's focused on all these open source uh, protocols. Um, now, once the, the government entities are starting to adopt it, we have all these companies out here that are building to it and also the differentiation of, of adding to it. How do we get the users engaged? Mm -hmm. You know, how is it going to be easy for them? I sit here and to this day, I can't explain to my kids what blockchain is. And I try it a million different ways. And they still look at me and goes, I don't get it. So it, it, it's, we shouldn't be talking about that piece. It's as simple as a QR code. And then that the security level behind it will, 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 will create an environment where you don't have to worry that your identity is getting stolen. Right. Um, so let's talk about Okay. And let's talk about the sausage making here, the good yeah. stuff, right? So you, you made a commitment, open source um, was the direction that you were going. And the whole purpose of why we're here is, here we go. This is basically the secret sauce into how you made so much progress between the day after Christmas and this point today. So the middle of our story is the sausage making, and this is the recipe. So Ken, do you want to share um, everyone the recipe? <laughs> Take one part cloud agent, one <laughs> part network or ledger that sits underneath it, one part mediator agent, add some custom UIs on top, and voila, you will have a delici delicious uh, closed loop ecosystem. 
A closed loop e ecosystem is a great place to start because you, if you just build, for instance, the part that's probably the most interesting to Liquid Avatar, the, the mobile agents and the, the ability to, to interact with those customers, uh, you don't have the pieces of an issuer or a verifier. In order to have some a fully usable system, you have to look at all of the players, make sure that there's software provided for each of them so they can participate, and then um, bring them all together into a functioning system. The, uh, the beauty of the, the system that Liquid Avatar now has is that the Indicio validator nodes, the, the blockchain that under, underpins that all, is not something they had to write code for. That's something that's already there and, and anyone can take advantage of. The, the cloud agents were written in the open source community and the Aries community and are available for anybody to adapt. The mediator agent that Indicio um, stood up to, to polish and make work well, and the mobile agent is now an open source project as well. But you can't just take the open source agents, plunk them down in their vanilla form and expect it to match closely the requirements of, of the solution that any individual company is looking for. So it's taking the evaluating the open source agents, seeing what's missing or what should be uniquely presented to the user in a specific workflow so that it's very easy for them to use and very easy for the, the other partners involved in the system, the issuing agents and the verifiers to take a look at how that uh, data is going to be issued in the first place. How do you determine who to issue it to? And then how do those verifiers know how to use it in order to accomplish their business reason? Not, not the cryptography, not the uh, Kamenich Latinsky signatures at the very bottom of the stack. That doesn't matter to the end users. They wanna know that that's there and they can trust it, but they don't wanna know the details of how cryptography um, functions uh, work. They want to know how does it change my life? Can I log in without a password now? Or can I uh, establish my identity when I go to apply for a loan or when I check out at the grocery store? That's what they want to know. And that's, I think, where RJ's vision has focused. So RJ, I don't want to give away the end of this story that you survived the open source sausage making, but can you talk to us about your experience going through this and perhaps maybe the the biggest aha moments um, through the process? Yeah, um, so there's quite a few of them actually, um, but I wanted to add on with, with Ken, and this is, gonna, this is gonna date me, but I remember being freshly out of school and was working for a large Fortune 500 company and they were teaching me how to get access to the internet, how to tunnel in. And it wasn't really the internet, it was the intranet. And we had, the company had its own little intranet that we can play in. And the reason why they didn't plug into the internet is because they didn't understand it enough. It wasn't developed enough. It wasn't mature enough in the security risks. So we'd come into the intranet, do the company processes, then we can leave the intranet. And there's always um, lots of training about what environment you're in and what you can do. Well, that was phase one for the internet. And when it moved to the next level, we don't have intranets anymore. Now it's matured enough where you do have internet um, and the internets aren't a process you have to go through. That's what I kind of, the analogy I use for the closed loop ecosystems. There are so many altruistic individuals in all of these open source communities that want to build the product that's going to be perfect for every possible scenario. Um, and you, you know, you sit in these meetings and you're trying to push things forward and get something started. And you realized that, you know what, we want to support those and we'll always be there to support them, but we got to get started. And working with our, all of our partners and, and, and especially Ken and, and Heather, you know, let's start with a closed loop ecosystem. We have all of the parts. And when I mean the parts, not necessarily the, the products, because we have the products, but we have the partners. We have the partners that are asking us to help build out these solutions around testing for PCR tests and using them at work environments. And it was like, wait a minute, we let's start with this closed loop where we do an invite only to the labs, invite only to the, the, the businesses or the venues and get it working and work out all the bugs and the kinks, which we've done. Now it's time to go to the next level, which is we have an open invite. Uh, I was in a meeting in, in one of these open source communities, and I said, anyone that wants to, to partner with us and move this closed loop ecosystem forward, 
we welcome you, right? Everyone's invited because then now it starts growing and then we start building out some of the other processes that allow us to go from an intranet to the internet. Uh, I want to back it up one step okay. prior to that, because um, I think that it was it's important to look at as we try to put our closed loop system together, that we start with prototypes and trials at okay. that early stage. And there's two good reasons for doing that. One is that you can see it in action. And then instead of trying to explain it with words, you can explain it with, look, here's how it works right now. And, and that discussion, both internal to the company to explain it from the technology side to the marketing and business sides, and then also external to the company, to the new partners that you wanna bring on board or to have a cu new customer evaluate it is really critical to, to go through a very simple prototype of what you're trying to do and a very small MVP, and then um, put it out in a trial basis. And as that happens, new use cases will pop up faster than you can imagine and will get added to your list of cool things to add. But you're already in the position of receiving feedback from the internal company people, the partners, the end users. You're starting to, to gather that momentum around the, the initiative and it uh, uh, helps prove its credibility and get the feedback that you need so that you're not introducing a product that missed the mark. You're, you're already engaged with all of those people and they're providing feedback along the development cycle. Once you get into production, that's a great step. Then you can look at the, the process of scaling and making it um, uh, broader, more users. Uh, a great problem to have is I, we have so many users that the servers are starting to bog down. What do we do next? That's a great problem to address at that point. But the, the idea of taking it from very small and demonstrable steps and then uh, scaling it out is, I think you've, you've, you've done an excellent job of that in uh, both internally in your own company and with your partners that you've been uh, showing this to as, as the technology has been uh, growing and, and maturing. So now, Ken, someone who's joined us here and is um, looking for to understand what is in the open source community as it applies to decentralized identity. How do they go figure that out? So the open source communities, typically the, the living ones, uh, have uh, typically have a repo, a GitHub repo or something like that, where the uh, repository, where the code is stored. Typically documentation is available there. They may have a wiki or they may have a website that's associated with it to help explain how uh, new people can participate. Um, they typically have working groups, a main working group, and perhaps sub-working groups that focus on specific problems or issues that need to be addressed in the community. Those meeting frequencies are typically on a weekly or every other week cycle so that work is done outside of the meetings. Uh, the group gets together to discuss or demonstrate the, the contributions that they're making or to resolve questions. And then um, uh, minutes are kept. Sometimes there's recordings of the meetings that you can watch but that allows for people to um, participate in the discussion. Uh, don't be shy about going and participating in one of those meetings and, and listening first, and then asking questions, and then contributing as you, as you gain a deeper understanding of what's going on. Uh, there's typically also either Slack or Rocket Chat, some type of a chat mechanism or an email thread where you can go ask questions, or you can, um, find out or listen to the conversation that's going on there and, and find out more about how the open source community is working. But typically okay. those, those are uh, open to uh, the rules of whatever open source community, the Hyperledger community is open to all. I, I want to add a little bit to that because I just lived it over the last two years. Right. And, and, I, and also, RJ, to talk to it from a, a chief revenue officer, you have a business side role. So I'm interested in hearing your perspective over the yep. last year. So, so for me, it was, it was just getting the white papers. They do such a great job of getting the community together to, to put together a document that explains what their goals are, how they're building it. So my first recommendation is go to those different sites, download their white paper and read their white paper, not just once. Put notes on it and read it a second time, right? I, I would be sitting there at baseball games in between innings, reading, you know, reading these white papers, and you learn so much. Then attend the meetings and just be a, a fly on the wall. Listen, you'll find 
the players in each of the organizations. And you'll be shocked at how friendly and inviting these individuals are because they want you to help. They want you to participate. I've met some of the uh, most creative and generous individuals in these organizations where I know it's going to be lifelong friendships and, and they're going to say, hey, can you help out with this? Can you guys build a template for this? Um, and then they'll ask you to chair one of the committees. And once that happens, it, it, it's in your blood now. You're just part of it. Um, and then everybody just continues to share, right? Because it's an open source community where we want all you know, companies to move forward. Um, and so that, that's what I recommend. What's a challenge in the open source community is figuring out what the business model is, right? We, we all have, you know, whether board of directors or shareholders, but we all have to answer the bottom line. And that is the channel challenge in these communities. These communities aren't to discuss that, right? I mean, it's clear from day one in, in, in the different aspects and uh, um, mandates that they have, especially with Linux, is that you're not to talk about pricing. You're not to talk about project or collusion or anything. So it's, this isn't the platform for it. Um, but as you build and find companies that are doing the same things as you, there's partnerships to be developed. And from those partnerships, you can, you can find the different business models. And that's, that's what we're doing. So let's talk about the excitement that was yesterday, and that was <laughs> the Cardia Interopathon. And just for folks who um, have not heard of Cardia, Cardia is an open source project to spur the exchange of health credentials that is hosted by the Linux Foundation Public Health. Um, Indicio and CETA, SITA, the airline technology provider, made the initial contribution of that code to the open source community. Liquid Avatar found themselves in a place where they needed to have verifiable health credentials as a part of their solution, and therefore joined the open source community of Cardia, became a steering committee member. Um, I think RJ, you didn't even know this was happening until Cardia was announced and you were all in and you were able to incorporate Cardia and that open source code into your solution. And so Ken, do you want to talk about what the Interopathon, the goal of it was yesterday? And then RJ, you were on the front, you got a front row seat and you were the one out testing and tell us about your experience then. So Cardia is a relatively new project in, in open source terms. It's only been in existence for several months. Uh, typically, as a project gets uh, started, um, you have maintainers of the code, you establish your meetings, and then uh, sometime six months or more later, you start to do your interop events to try to test interoperable solutions and prove that they work together. We're on an accelerated schedule at the Cardia project, and we decided to host an interop event very early in the project's uh, life cycle. An interop event is where you have um, both a reference implementation that uh, shows how the code might be implemented. And then you have solutions from different vendors or governments or universities or whoever wants to bring their solutions and test them to test against both the reference implementation and then test against each other to, to find out where the, the uh, interop ability is strong and where it might be weak or where there's friction points in the system that need either better definition or more code development to make it work smoother. Um, the interop event um, typically uh, starts off fairly small. They're usually held on a regular basis quarterly or semi-annually for the slow moving projects. Uh, but the, the idea is to get people together frequently as the code evolves and matures and test out that uh, how well they work together. You expect to find some roaring successes and you expect to find some dismal failures. That's part of an interop. If you don't set the goals high enough, everything just works fine and it's too simple and you haven't really stressed the system to find the weak points. In an interop event, you are trying to find where the products um, don't work well together and push the envelope to, to uh, further progress and mature the, the product lines. So we held that. We had a number of companies show up. Uh, it was an exciting event. RJ, you want to talk about how 
from your perspective, what it looked like? Yeah, it was really exciting. I mean, the, the analogy I like to use is like a preseason game, right? We're all getting ready uh, to, to leverage verifiable credentials, but we need to test it. We need to have that scrimmage, those preseason games. And that's, that's what it was. So there, there were a number of companies that came out um, and we all tested the ver so that trust triangle that you just showed. So we have ver wallets, issuers, and verifiers. So we all used our three different pieces with each other. Um, we broke out into small groups and you, know, you got to share your screen and, and scan QR codes and uh, leverage the foundation that's given to us through Cardia, right? So you, you mentioned the whole Cardia and, and um, the health project. I can't be an expert on all vaccinations. And what's really neat about these open source projects is I can though participate and add value. Um, and in the, in, in the Cardia group, as I sit here and I look, there's experts from you know, W3C and verifiable credentials. There's experts from you know, the health industry to understand the different codes that go in different vaccinations because it's not just one vaccination, it's all vaccinations. There's the research that we as an individual company would have to go through would be, you know, just a huge hurdle and barrier. But through open source, we can contribute to building out what that schema is that would meet all the different vaccinations that are out there, but also the different locations around the world. Um, so being a part of that group and then using that schema that still, it still can be uh, updated and, and grow and mature just like everything else. Uh, but it gives us a, that line in the sand where we start and then it's the scrimmage time. Let's everyone else that's built into these verifiable credentials that have these different ecosystems and different partners. Let's try the interoperability because it's the user that has the control. So let's plug and play. And we did it and it was a lot of fun. Um, I, I think I, I did demos and in interoperability with four to six different companies. Um, and most of the time it worked. It worked really, really well. Uh, we found two or three challenges that were back to the drawing board to fix. Um, but that's, that's part of it, right? That's, that's exactly what happens in preseason. So as we bring this conversation to an end, I want to take what you saw and experienced in the Interopathon, where you witnessed multiple companies actually able to be interoperable and share credentials amongst each other. And then I want to roll in the announcement from the government of Ontario and their vision for their digital identity system. First, I'll start with you, RJ. When you combine those two experiences that just happened, what do you see for the future of open source decentralized identity technology? Uh, I, I see the, the, instead of concept, I see reality now, right? So there's two pieces. Companies that haven't even talked to each other, I, some of these folks I haven't even met, uh, we were able to create and exchange verifiable credentials that had all of this security uh, from blockchain and, and cryptographic uh, security, right? Then couple that with the fact that government agencies are now really realizing that they have to set um, the precedence or uh, make the tough decisions on how companies can use uh, open standards in order to meet the government requirements that they have around PEPIDA or GDPR. So it, it's, it's, for me, it's very exciting that everything's finally coming together, what we've been working on for a year plus, if not a lot longer than that, some folks, but our company a year and a half, um, is that now it's come to fruition where we can actually use the technology and at the same time, yeah, the government of Ontario, Ontario, the province, releasing a press release saying we will have a verifiable credential and all of the standards that they mention are the standards that we've been building on since day one. And Ken, what's the future? So I think that Ontario has uh, um, laid out a good foundation for where they want to go, a good roadmap. They're looking at both the existing technologies that are already functional today that uh, companies such as um, Liquid Avatar are already building on top of and delivering today. And they're also looking forward to the next iteration of, of version two of the DIDCOM 
uh, protocol and they're looking forward to new signature formats as the cryptography is made more efficient and stronger um, have a good solution now and they're looking at a roadmap of uh, where do the next steps in the in the maturity of the um, technology going but I think they've also laid out some interesting core principles that align with uh, both legal frameworks and regulatory frameworks that control um, how technology should interact with people. How, what is the pri privacy preservation policy? How are people to be treated? How do they control their own identity and their own credentials in, in a, gr a growing and evolving ecosystem? I think the government's announcement also indicates that there are many um, self-organizing communities of credentials, ecosystems of credentials being established. But as long as they're following these standards, then the other solutions that are also built on similar standards can interop and uh, effectively have an, uh, a broad network effect of um, being able to use a credential that was uh, originally a driver's license credential only for the use in driving can now be used for um, establishing a bank account or identity uh, proofing for proof of employment and other, other use cases that are not the initial use case that was targeted, but um, make for a life similar to our, our hard credentials that we have in our wallets, our plastic cards and paper credentials that we have now, to be able to use those and control those in a similar way so that we can use those identity credentials that are stored in our digital wallets and uh, have those same type of ad hoc interactions as well as the ones that were originally planned in the ecosystem design in the beginning. I, I'm excited. I want to thank everyone for joining us. This is Ken Ebert, CTO of Indicio Tech, RJ Riser, Chief Revenue Officer at Liquid Avatar Technologies. I'm Heather Dahl, CEO of Indicio Tech. We just spent over a half hour talking about how you can start simple to build your decentralized identity solution. I want to thank you for joining us. And now we will move into the question and answer portion of this session. Thank you. Thank you.